Let us stand together for the reading of God's Word. Open your Bible to the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, and find chapter number 8. Chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. We're looking at verse, uh, verses 19 and 20. Amen. Oh, I want you to know that I'm using my water holder thing. I got that drawer out. Water in the little spot there. Okay, amen. All right. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 8, beginning at verse number 19, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead? To the law, to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. They shall pass through it, hardly uh, beasted and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. Now that passage has got some stuff in it. I can almost guarantee some of you are going, what? Starting with beasted or bestead. So we'll get into all that. Not tonight, but this passage serves as foundation for the next three messages, and it's one of those situations where we preach to the text. We're going to go through something, then I'm going to come back to this text, you're going to go, oh, whoa. But right now, look particularly at verse number 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because, or it is because, there is no light in them. Father, help us indeed to speak according to this word. Let that light shine bright through and in us that will show us the way, your way, the right way, the good way. I pray, Father, that you will bless tonight's message as we begin talking now about how we've come to a place where so many people live with unbelief concerning the Bible and don't even realize they're doing that. But Lord, help us with that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. We're transitioning now in our series. We have been talking about hermeneutics, which is the work of getting from the Bible what God intended to give us through it. That is rightly understanding what it says. It's the work of hermeneutics. The first thing we're doing, we, we went over some basic things, the, the nine rules, the, etc. But then we said, okay. Let's ask and answer the question, which version should we use? Because there are plenty of them to choose from. And you can use any combination of letters in the alphabet, and probably if you get three, at least three letters, you will have identified one of the versions available today. There are so many of them. So which version should we use? Well, a lot of people would say, it doesn't matter. Just find one you like, and there you go. Well, the problem with that, well, there are many problems with that, but one of the problems with that is that these versions are not really in agreement. Some of them disagree in fundamental ways. <clears throat> People don't know that. Your average Christian is not aware of, of how divergent the, re- the renderings are between these versions. Um, I guess a lot of Christians today don't really read the Bible like it's, you know, the objective word of God. They read it more like a subjective devotional reader. Truly, most Christians today, it seems to me, read the Bible like you read a devotional. They just look in it for something that makes them feel this way or that way and reflect on some neat ideas or thoughts. They don't look at it as the objective, word-for-word, Word of God. They don't see it that way. Well, it hasn't always been that way. I grew up when we thought, we took the Bible very seriously as a dogmatic, a dogmatic, excuse me, expression of the mind of God in word to give direction to our lives that we might know his mind in his way and understand his will. That's the way we understood the Bible. That's the way we took it. It wasn't until I got into Bible college <clears throat> where for the first time in my life I experienced somebody saying this. 
Well, this verse reads this way in our King James Bible, but it would be better this way. From the, at that time, the ASV was the popular one to promote. And they would say, it, it, the rendering is more accurate in the ASV, the American Standard Version. Before that, it was the Revised Standard Version. So, that was the first time I've ever heard anything. I had heard anything like that, and it, it literally blew my mind. I mean, I sat there paralyzed. I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing all my life up till then. All I understood about the Bible was this. It's God's Word. That's it. That's God's Word. My dad would talk about it all the time, and my, my mother, as you've heard me say, would very jealous about that. If we put anything on top of the Bible, she'd come by and, you know, like we used to have what they called uh, Reader's Digest. Anybody remember that? Okay. Well, if somebody happened to be Reader's Digest and reading it and set it down on top of the Bible, oh, that's bad news. My mom would come through the house if she saw the Reader's Digest or any other TV guide. That was another one that was always around the house, right? TV guide? Yeah, okay. So if she saw either of those or anything, really, on the Bible, she would pick it up and look around and just look at us with, I don't know how to, I can't, I need to bring my mom here sometime and have her give you the look. So you'll understand from then on what I mean when I say this. But she would just give us all the look. And we were all, (laughs) not me, not me. But we weren't supposed to put anything on top of the Bible. The Bible was the Word of God. I was a kid and, and uh, living with my grandmother, and my grandfather was a, a pastor, and my uh, grandmother, of course, a deep woman of deep faith, great faith. And uh, when we were going to leave there, she wanted to give me a gift. She gave me the Bible, and she handed the Bible to me, and uh, I reached out to take it. It was a New Testament, and I pulled it, but she wouldn't let it go. And I had to look up at her, and I remember looking up into her face. And I don't know how to describe it. But something just came out of her as she said to me these words, Jerry, this is the word of God. And I don't know how to describe it other than to say how my my response to it was like just awe, awe of her, awe of this book. This Wow, what a book. This is God's word. So we had a reverence for the word of God. And I grew up in that kind of influence. Uh, I remember as a kid being at the beach at Seal Beach and, and some Kids were out there gathered together, mocking God, blaspheming God, and I was sitting down over here. And I wasn't even a Christian at the time, but I had had those influences, so I knew that the Bible was an important book. And I was sitting there eating a hunk. Remember those candy bars, the hunks? Yeah, those things, they last all day long. Yeah. They really get your money's worth out of those things, amen? So I was sitting there enjoying, uh, just starting on one of my hunk bars there, and uh, these kids were gathered around, and and this kid was holding up a Bible, and he was mocking it and blaspheming it, and it was bothering me. And I'm watching. And then he took a lighter, and he lit it, and he was going to burn that Bible. Well, I stood up, and I walked over there, and I'm thinking, man, I can't let that guy burn that Bible. But what am I going to do? They were all, you know, I was just a little kid at that time. I didn't start growing until I was in, like, junior year. Yeah, I was like three foot two. No, I was a little bit bigger than that, but not much. I was small and frail, skinny. I know, it's hard to believe. But uh, so I, but I, I was just a little guy, and I walk up there, and these guys were all towering over me, and this guy was getting ready to burn the thing, and I'm thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab that and run for it. Happily for me, a really big guy noticed me. We, we kind of caught eyes, and he just kind of looked at me, I don't know, kind of nodded. I, I just got the feeling he was saying, hold on. And then he stepped up, took the Bible out of the guy's hand, slapped him. Not hard, just a little, what are you doing, you idiot? And then he looked at me, and then he walked away. I say all that to try to bring you back to that classroom when I'm sitting there as a young preacher boy now, just got called to preach not too long before, uh, highly, you know, really enthusiastic and excited. And this is my, oh, it couldn't have been more than my first, or second or third day in school. And I've come to learn the Bible. And I'm sitting there and this teacher says, this verse would be read better this way. Now, I understand something right now. I understand many, perhaps even in this room, would be like, well, it's a big deal. Because you grew up in that. 
you grew up with this version or that version or another version and so on. I didn't grow up in that. I grew up believing the Bible was the absolute word of God. We didn't doubt a single word of it. It was just all God's word. I never heard anything like this before. So I'm sitting there, and he says that. It was devastating. Literally, with my Bible open in front of me, an eager student, ready to learn, I hear that. I push my Bible away. And I raised my hand. And he called on me, and I said, how can I trust any of it? How do I know which version to use? How am I supposed to know whether the Bible is true when I'm reading it? And he got flabbergasted and tried, oh, no, 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 no. And I kept pressing him. I said, well, if this verse is wrong, I need a list of verses that are wrong. I need a list. Where do I find a list of all the verses that are wrong with my Bible? I was upset. Boy, that bothered me. But it also drew me into a study. And I began studying this issue and this question. And the more I studied it, the deeper I got into all this thing, the more I realized that this is really more about simple faith than it is all kinds of nonsense about textual criticism. And we're going to start talking about textual criticism tonight. But before we go there, I'm just going to give you a, a simple way to understand this. Jesus was reading from a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, right? When he came, it was 1,400 and is it 80 years and some change since Moses first wrote the Pentateuch, and then Jesus showed up. So Jesus is showing up at a time when the Bible had been copied and copied and copied and copied and copied and copied and copied. He goes into the synagogue, he opens up the scripture, and he didn't even bother to tell us that there were some errors. Why didn't he fix it then? Wouldn't that have been a good time to fix it? It didn't need fixing. By the supernatural providence of God, he kept it so that there wasn't a jot or a tittle missing when Jesus read it. In fact, that's what Jesus said about it. Not a jot or a tittle would in any wise pass until everything in it was fulfilled. That was Jesus' attitude about the Bible. He had such respect for it. Of course, he would know. But he had such respect for it that he interpreted it and would, and would rely upon the tense of a verb to underlie a major doctrine like the resurrection. Yeah, when, when some Sadducees showed up and they were sad, you see, because they denied the resurrection, so they had no hope. Uh -huh. Anyway, they came with this question about the resurrection. And Jesus challenged them. Have you not read? The Bible says that I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. And he is the God of the living and not the dead. Now, what's my point? My point is this. When you study that out, you'll realize that Jesus rested his argument on the tense of a verb. Because God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's not the God of the dead, but the living. Therefore, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. That was his point. Isn't that wonderful? But my point tonight is, did you notice? Jesus rested the argument, his argument, to support the, re the, the resurrection on the tense of a verb. That's how perfectly and accurately the Bible has been preserved all the way up to him. But of course, after Jesus, there was just no accounting for what happened because God let go and the Bible just went all to pieces. But Jesus said, my words shall not pass away. And I got to reading that verse one time and realizing when it says that my words shall not pass away, well, how many of these words in this book are your words? And then I read in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh. And I realized that according to the Bible, the testimony of Scripture is this. Jesus Christ is the Word, and Jesus Christ is the origin of all the words that are in the book that reveal the Word. And so we know the Word by the words, and the Word gave us the words. All of the words of the Bible are His. When He said, my words will not pass away, He wasn't talking about those things He said that, that are printed in red in your, in your red letter edition. He's referring to the entire Bible. 
It all came from Jesus Christ. And well, if I, each, each of these little statements I'm making are entire sermons. I don't have time to preach them. Jesus said, my words shall not pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. And you start digging around the scripture, you find out from Psalm number 12, the Father said, His word is perfect. And that He said, I will preserve my words from this generation forever. And then there are those people who just don't like the idea that there's a Bible that is, you know, that will hold them accountable. They don't like that. There's a spirit in them that chafes at the idea that there's an authority in that book. They don't like that. They want a book that they can be the authority over. I'm the authority. This verse isn't, shouldn't say this. This verse should say that. So what happens? The, the flock of God is feeding on the authority of the pastor. He's the authority. I'm the, dis, the distributor of the Word of God. I'll tell you what is the Word of God. That's that old hellish Catholic spirit that the Protestant Reformation was a reaction to. But it sneaked back in to our churches where now these pastors preside over the Word of God instead of preaching under it. I guess I could be like this. That's where I belong. Under it. It's the authority, not me. But that spirit is at work, and it likes to, it doesn't like the idea that there's this objective authority that's absolute. We don't like absolute authority. We want kind of authoritative. We're comfortable with an authority out there that's, you know, that we can kind of manipulate and control and fix it to say what we want it to say. And, but we tend to be uncomfortable in our flesh with an authority that's absolute. In fact, you've noticed that the spirit of, uh, of the age is contrary to anything absolute. There's no such thing as absolute. They don't like absolute. <laughs> The, the flesh goes like absolute. They want to be absolute. I'm the absolute one. I'm absolute, not anything outside of me. It's a bad spirit, my friends. God wants us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, and we submit ourselves to his word, and we're controlled by his word. Check your Bible. Out of his mouth is the word, and that word is going to destroy the whole earth. When he's done with this mess, it all comes under his word. And so he said, I will preserve my words from this generation forever. But that spirit that's at work, contrary to the spirit of the Bible, says, well, now let's preside over that verse. Here's what that verse is actually saying. He will preserve his word from this generation. He's going to preserve it from them messing it up. He's not going to let them mess up his word. So they're saying. In other words, in other words, instead of being a time delimiter, I'm going to preserve my word from now until forever. I'm going to preserve my word from these people right here. So I like to play with them. I say, well, first of all, I do know enough Hebrew to tell you you're wrong. We can go there if you want to. But let's just think about it for a moment. If he's going to preserve the word from that generation, but he's going to let the next generation mess it up, I'm trying to figure out how much sense God has. Why would God be jealous about it? I'm going to preserve it from this generation, but the next generation can mess it up. I'm going to preserve it from this generation. He did say forever. How long is that generation going to be around? Not forever. It's just stupid. It's a, it's a foolish way to, it, it's just manipulating the Bible. It's that spirit I talked about. I'm not going to get up under that book. That book isn't going to rule me. I'm going to rule the book. It's a bad spirit. And most of those who are involved in this do not know what spirit they are of. They don't know. They don't see it. They haven't stopped to discern the spirits, to try the spirits, to see if they are of God. They just got wrapped up in this. It went along like the bobblehead Christians I talk about so often. Right? You've seen the bobbleheads? 
in the cars. You just go with whatever little bump and the head goes that way. You know, a lot of Christians who spend about three seconds thinking about almost nothing. Now, I'm being facetious and I'm speaking in hyperbole in order to make a point. You know, slap, 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 slap. <laughs> okay, but relax. I'm just trying to help you out. If it happens to be kind of impacting you, say what you ought to say. Thanks, I needed that. Because we need to wake up. How is it that we're accepting these, these multiple versions and not even bothering to stop and say, wait a minute now, do I, why should I trust this one better than that one? What makes that one better? It doesn't matter that some of these versions, like the NIV, leave out in, you know, like seven or eight verses, passages of seven or eight verses in length, just leave them out. That doesn't matter? Why doesn't that matter to somebody? Why? And I know this is being facetious because obviously it wouldn't be the case, but you might think, why does this only matter to me? Am I the only one who cares that I've had a Bible I've been reading for all my life and now somebody's come along and said, oh, by the way, seven verses don't belong there. Who says? What do I do? Okay. Okay. Just take my Bible away. Okay, take that verse. You want that verse? You can have it. Okay. Why? Because I don't care about the Bible. I don't care about God's Word. I don't care about that. All I want to do is be Christian and say hi to my brothers and sisters in Jesus. I don't care about the Bible. That's why they can do whatever they want to it, and nobody cares. Now, I'm talking to some folks who care. I think you have a different spirit. You have that spirit in you, the same spirit that wrote this book. If you have the spirit in you that wrote this book, then you're going to be jealous for that book. And you're not going to be comfortable with somebody coming along and saying, like Jehudi, you remember the story of Jehudi? He took the uh, parchments of Jeremiah and he cut them, snipped out verses, threw them away in the fire. Finally got bored with it, threw the whole thing in the fire. Jehudi's knife has been at work, snipping the Bible to pieces. A lot of Christians have just sat back and watched and said, oh, yeah, and, you know, take the, the TV channel changer. We don't care. Hopefully, however, the Spirit of God in me, through me, will wake up the spirit in you that will stop and say, wait a minute here, what's this about? God said he would preserve his words from this generation forever. The Bible says that when God gave the word to Moses, he said not only, <laughs> is that the case, but the things that happened to Israel and that were written down happened to them and were written down for us upon whom the ends of the world are come. So, it was written for us. Specifically for us. Not that it wasn't for them too, but you get my point. Now, Paul's the one who said that. Anybody have an argument with Paul? Has anybody found a Jehudi who has clipped that verse out yet? They've missed that one so far. That one you'll find in all the versions. What happened to them, happened to them. And what was written down, was written down. Back then, for us today, upon whom the ends of the world are come. What does that mean? Well, that means that when God wrote it then, He was thinking about us now. That means that God intended this book for us. So if God gave it, by inspiration, everybody can believe that. Oh, there's so many orthodox Christians. They're orthodox. I'm not mocking orthodoxy. I believe orthodoxy is good. I'm mocking something else. They're orthodox. They believe in the inspiration of the scriptures. Who cares? Who cares if they were given by inspiration if you don't have them now? 
easy to believe. Easy to believe in a Bible that was perfect. Hard to believe in one that's, that is. Oh, it's easy to believe that, yeah, back there in the day, yeah, they, you know, back then they really had a Bible. Whoo, boy, you can believe it back then. You can know you had the whole Bible back then, back then. But today, no, nah, well, we've done a pretty good job. Who's done a good job? To whom do we owe this great debt? At whose feet do we kneel and say, oh, thank you for the Bible? Let me tell you, my knee bows to one, Jesus Christ. Not to, the, not to the higher critics. Not to the quote-unquote scholars. I, I, I don't need to thank the scholars for keeping the Bible for me. God did that. So what we're doing is we're showing how to find it. You see, the Bible says that God has given His Holy Spirit. His Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And he said that his spirit would guide us to all truth. And he said in John 17, 17, thy word is truth. So if I know God promised to preserve his words, and if I know Jesus, by the time it came to Jesus, it was all there in Jesus' day, and he passed it on to those after him, and it went right on along the way. And the whole point of the exercise in the first place, the reason he gave it by inspiration, was so that we could have a Bible today, that we could trust and have confidence in and be guided by. That's the whole point of the inspiration originally. So the Bible teaches preservation. The Bible demonstrates preservation. And so I believe in preservation because the Bible teaches it. So the question isn't, can we find, you know, is, is there a perfectly preserved inspired scripture available to us today that's not the question that question is answered in the bible the question remaining is which one is it and so i've been given the holy spirit who is to guide me to all truth and i'm warned hey brethren don't believe every spirit try the spirit to see if they be of god so i'm supposed to test the spirit of each of these versions to ascertain whether or not it comes from the Spirit of God or from some other spirit. Well, that's the work we're doing right now. And we've talked about a lot of things that we can't go back over right now, and somebody said amen. Thank you, preacher. We've been at this for about 27 messages. And we're not going to, you know, recap all of that. But you can go online, you can find them, you can kind of catch up with the class. No need to do that, though, uh, necessarily, because there's enough information in each message to each one stands on its own. In any event, tonight, we're going to move from our discussion about the Septuagint. I called, I called that set of messages the Septuagint Swindle. And you ought to get those messages and listen to them. Now, we're going to look at the origin of modern textual criticism. The origins of modern textual criticism takes us to a fellow by the name of Origen, <laughs> uh, pun intended. But his name is Origen. And we're going to ask and answer the question, who is he? So, let's get started on that. Now, I thought this was an excellent way to bridge from the, our discussion about the Septuagint into our discussion of the origin of all this mess. I was online, I found a site, actually it's a pretty good site, and uh, it was talking about textual criticism, offering some definition, clarification on what textual criticism is. And I noticed somebody who had been on the site wrote a response and asked a question of those who had put this website together, and I, I noticed the question, I thought, wow, listen, listen to this, so I'm going to read it to you. This person, I'm going to have to, edit. you know how it is when you write a question or when you text a message, you mess up the grammar? So I'm going to clean up the grammar here, is that okay? I, okay, thank you, because otherwise I'm going to have to be trying to explain what the guy's trying to say. But here's what he's, he's written, textual criticism and the transmission of the text, are they the same thing? For example, since Paul was reading and citing the LXX, remember the LXX, you know what that is? 
in, in Roman numerals, LXX, LXX is 70. L50, XX, 10, 10, 70. And that's what the word Septuagint means. So he's talking about the Septuagint. Do you hear him? He says, since Paul was reading and citing the Septuagint. No, nah, we just spent three or four sun, uh, Wednesday nights, Sunday nights, whatever it is this is, <laughs> debunking that myth. But he goes on. He says, however, there are variants between the LXX and the Hebrew text. He says, I mean, if we say that the Hebrew is accurate and Paul's writings are accurate, and Paul wrote from the LXX, what are we really saying about the text? On the one hand, we are self-congratulatory about the accuracy of our texts and translations, but on the other hand, there is documented for us, loud and clear, the obvious reality that the accurate readings of the New Testament and the accurate readings in the Hebrew Old Testament are different. Ah, a student who's paying attention. Good for him. He says, do we have a measure of consistency between the New Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament by which we can get a more realistic percentage of agreement? Or in other words, he's saying, go ahead and give me a list of all the problems so I can get them corrected. I mean, he's in the same place I was in those many years ago. He doesn't get it. What do you, what's going on here? He bought this junk about Paul quoting from the LXX. He bought that. But then he did further study, and he noticed, he said, wait a minute now, this LXX doesn't line up with the Hebrew Old Testament. That's weird. He's beginning to question and ask, you know, what's going on here? The answer was very simple, and I congratulate those who are handling this website. They put it this way, quote, The simple, hard reality before us is that there has not been found any pre-Christian Greek Old Testament, there is no undisputed extant LXX known to exist today that was written prior to Christ. Most of you were able to follow that without any problem. Basically what he said is there's no such thing as a Septuagint. It doesn't exist. Which is what I've been telling you for the last three weeks. There is no Septuagint. It's made up. It's a myth. It's the Septuagint swindle. The whole idea that the Apostle Paul, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, Jewish from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, would prefer to quote from a Greek translation than from his own Hebrew text is like, what? That didn't like ring a bell in somebody's head? You see, there's an agenda, and I don't want to go back and preach those sermons. I've already done that work. But I wanted to show you how this bridges. Because the bottom line is, when we come to textual criticism, there is no support for any idea of a Greek translation of the Old Testament that existed before Christ. It wasn't there. All right, let's go ahead and get into this. What is textual criticism? The Bible was written at a time when the means for sharing documents were different from what they are today. Today, when I want someone to read one of my manuscripts that I'm working on, I put it on a thing called Dropbox, and they go to a folder, and they pop it up, and bang, there it is. When I want to send to you my notes and outlines for Know Your Bible series, or I want to send to you my notes and outlines for the prophecy course that we're doing on Sunday mornings, I create these things convert them into a PDF and stick them in what's called an email. In fact, I have a little, it's so, it's so nifty because I can put prophecy conference and boom, all of your email addresses populate the send it to these people field. And then I drop this document in there and I hit a button, boom, it goes out to all of you, all at once, just like that. Back in this day, you went, you wrote, and you had to copy by hand, it is a very different world. So, when the church in Thessalonica, 
received a letter purported to be by Paul, and Paul learned about it. He wrote to the church, and he exposed it as a fraud, as a hoax. This has been going on for a long time. Textual criticism is the work of sorting all of that out. That's what textual criticism is. Textual criticism assembles all of the manuscript evidence, evaluates the different pieces, and does the work of sorting through all that and putting together and choosing this manuscript, uh, this, this reads this way and this one reads this way, and then 15 of them read consistently this way, and three of them read with an inconsistency, and they go through all that work. You follow? You understand what I'm saying? So somebody's doing that work, and that's called textual criticism. The word criticism isn't being used here in the sense that, well, the way your mother criticizes your homework or your homework habits. Just seeing this, you're getting support at home or your school here. <laughs> so, the, or, the way, or the way dad criticizes everything you do, right? Okay. Okay. So I can, yeah, anyway. So, uh, not that kind of criticism. It's being used in the sense of analyzing and studying and all that stuff. That's the idea. Critiquing. So it's really simple. It's not hard to understand. Textual criticism is a needed discipline. All of these original letters were written in the area of Antioch. Antioch and then through uh, what was then called Galatia or what we call it Asian or Turkey now is what we call it. We call it Turkey. And uh, so uh, these letters were written, for example, in Ephesus or, or across, over there, across the Asia and over there at Corinth. You know, the letters are written there in Athens, stuff like this. These letters are written in these different places and, uh, and then sent to these different churches like Colossae and stuff like this. And, and uh, so these, letter, these churches would receive these letters from the apostle and they would cherish them, understandably, and, and keep them. And then they would make copies there. Persons would be charged with the responsibility to take care of them and to make copies of them. And then others would come from other churches and, and, and get the letter to Colossae, to the Colossians, and, and carry that back to their church. And that was going on in that area of the world. We, and that created a body of textual evidence that's called the Antiochian text. Isn't that a neat word? Antiochian. You like that word? The Asiatic text, it's sometimes called Western text, sometimes it's referred to. These different names, they have some nuanced distinctions that we won't bother with right now. But that's what happened. And then there developed some competing schools and there was a school of Antioch, and then there was another school called the School of Alexandria. And that was over there in Egypt. So what happened is, over time, you know, the old devil's always trying to question God's word, but over time, he got it ahead of some people to play around and manipulate the textual evidence. And the first guy the one that's reputed to be the grandfather of that business is a guy named Origen. Now forgive our friends, forgive the, the back here. They're not going to be able to keep up with you here. I have not used any of the cues I gave them for changing the screens. So you guys can relax. I, they're back there sweating. Going, How, where in the world is he? Yeah, I, I did a free-for-all here, so don't worry about it. Just leave it there, okay? But anyway... Origin was is the granddaddy to that business of playing around with the Bible. Now let me explain some things about Origin. First of all, Origin did not believe that God preserved his words. He didn't believe that. Origin believed the best chance anyone has at finding the authoritative words of God would be to depend upon the scholarship of the Alexandrian school the school in Egypt. And the school in Egypt was at odds with the school in Antioch. The Antioch school was, well, what you'd call those, uh, well, it's a hard word to hear, so be, I just, I warned you as best I can, fundamentalist. The Antioch school, they were the fundamentalists. You know those guys. The Alexandrian school, well, now they were the liberals. They were the syncretic crowd. They were 
synthesizing Greek philosophy with Christian theology. It's literally what they were doing. Something called syncretism. And the Mother Church was all involved in the Alexandrian school. The Mother Church, as they call it. They're not my mother. But the so-called Mother Church came out of the Alexandrian school. Origen is practically, well, I think he is a saint. I think he's been sainted in the Catholic Church, if I remember right. They love Origen. Those who despised the Mother Church from Origen's point of view, that's those who despised. Now, Origen was actually before anything showed up that's called the Roman Catholic Church. He's from 184 to 254, or 80, 184 to 254. But his theological circles are the circles that, that grew into and became and morphed into Aristotelian theology that became the basis for the Roman Catholic system in his book called, what was it called? The, uh, I forget the name of that thing. The Holy Church or something like that? I forgot now. The Holy City. Ah, City of God. Had to think of it in Latin to get it. <laughs> okay, but the City of God. That was Aristotle's book that launched what we now call the Roman Catholic Church. And Aristotle is part of that Alexandrian school. Okay? So all of that kind of comes together that way, all right? And the theory of Origen and the Alexandrian crowd was that those fundamentalists, they're biased against us. And because of their bias against us, they, that was their whole thing. Uh, they were right. Yeah, we were biased against heretics who took the scriptures and twisted them and definitely had a really strong bias against heresy. Had a huge, strong bias against baptismal regeneration. Huge. We had a huge bias against people who use the scripture this way. 2 Peter 2, 4 and 17. The passage reads, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved into judgment. So on origin interpreted the chains of darkness that bound the angels in outer darkness. He referred to them as a black body of flesh. What? That knucklehead was saying that if you have a black body of flesh, you're one of these angels that was chained in darkness. Well, that sounds a little bit kind of like racism to me. Wow. Well, a lot of that kind of junk in here. We, we're going to skip over some of it because I've run out of my time. I know you're disappointed, but it's okay. We will pick it up next Sunday. Help me out a little bit here. At least let me believe or think that you're enjoying this, but we're getting, we're getting close to done. He was an avid Bible corrector. He accepted the Apocrypha, even though Jesus did not. When Jesus told us what Bible it is that he used, he talked about the one that was the law, the prophets, and the Psalms that did not include the Apocrypha. A lot of people don't understand the significance of Luke chapter number 24, verse 44. And a whole lot of this stuff that's going on with the Septuagint and with origin and textual criticism, modern textual criticism, because real textual criticism is valid, but modern text, uh, textual criticism reached back and took the heresies and the errors of origin and used it as a foundation for a new system of textual criticism that shifted us from the Antiochian text to the Alexandrian text. So now every single version coming down the Nile comes from the Alexandrian school. All of them. NIV, ASV, RSV, all of them. The only version that comes down the Jordan is the King James Bible. There are a couple of exceptions where they've, do, they've done some hybrids but I don't like hybrids. And we'll get into that later on also. In any event, he accepted the Apocrypha. And please understand, that's what a lot of this is about. Purgatory, a lot of this junk in the Catholic Church comes out of the Apocryphal books. 
He believed in baptismal regeneration. He suggested that unbaptized infants were bound for hell. He denied the physical resurrection. He rejected the historical account of Adam and Eve. His concept of God was what we call platonic, which means he thought of God in terms of a force in nature, not as a person. He believed in reincarnation of the soul and the transmigration of the soul. That's origin. Now, other than all of these things, you might have said that he was a Christian. Because at least he called himself one. There's a lot of other weird stuff that we'll get into the, we'll get into next time, but that gets you started. Textual criticism is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with textual criticism. We're not afraid of that. That's a good science. It's valid and it's useful. Because it does things like it says, for example, the Apocrypha does not belong in the Bible. Let me show you why. Boom, 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 boom. It does stuff like it says, this letter uh, purported to be from Paul was not from Paul. Here's why we know that. Bob, 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 bob. It does that work. It's good work. Modern textual criticism, however, is a whole different creature. It is approaching textual criticism from the presupposition that God did not preserve his words. That the church, meaning the holy so-called Holy Catholic Church, Holy Roman Catholic Church, that the church was the, has the sole authority of stewardship over the Bible. Now, that's the heart of this whole issue. That's what the fight is about. It's a fight over who controls or who has the authority to say what is God's word. And it's God who has that authority, not the church. Not this church, not any church. God has that authority. But the Roman Catholic Church wants to say, we are the stewards of the oracles of God. We will tell you what God said. That's the spirit of the Catholic Church. That's the spirit underlying this whole argument right now. But stand together, please. <clears throat> Well, each time we transition, I do a little reset, like we did with preservation and stuff like that. But now, next week and following, we will be focusing on who is Origen, in what way is he the grandfather of modern textual criticism, and what are the features of modern textual criticism, and further proofs of the thesis I just presented, which is, this is all about the Catholic Church saying, we have the right to tell you what is the Bible. That's what it's about. It's that same old spirit that told the people, you don't need to read the Bible. We will tell you what it says. Same thing. They couldn't take the Bible out of your hands. So what they did is they gave you a thousand to choose from, which compromises the authority. You know, they hate the King James Bible. I mean, they hate it. Ugh. Sometimes you can tell what's the right thing to go by who hates it. So I, if there's any, if I, if I didn't have a lot of information about this, I knew only this much, I would know that's the Bible I want. I want the one she hates. But it's, there's more to it than that, and we'll be going into it. We have been. Isn't it good to know we have the authoritative Word of God? I don't have that spirit that wants the Bible to be subject to me, to exalt my mind above the Bible. I want my mind to submit to the mind of God. I like it that I have a book that presents the mind of God to my mind, and I humble my mind to the mind of God. Amen? And I'm glad to do that. You know why? Because the same spirit that breathes through this book breathes in me. There's an affinity in the spirit of this book and the spirit that's in me. And the spirit in me bears witness and testifies to it. More on that as we proceed. Aren't you glad to have a Bible you can trust? Amen. If you still don't, if you still aren't convinced you have one you can trust, hang with me. We'll still we'll keep working on this. All right, let's respond to God. The Holy Spirit spoke to you somewhere along the way. Whatever he said to you, that's what you want to respond to. Let's respond to God. <laughs> 